Hi, in this video we're showing you the workflow used to transfer an asset made in Modeler to Stager and set up lights and materials. We're not using Substance Painter in any way for this video. I'm picking up with the model made in the previous video. To get it out of Modeler, we'll go to File, Export. We have a video dedicated specifically to exporting from Modeler, but a few key things are worth repeating. It's always best to use the UV mapped triangles export setting as it generates the most usable high quality meshes. It's a pretty slow and heavy export, so you might want to spend some time getting used to the triangle count slider. There's no one correct number here for all cases. Setting it too low gives models with artifacts. Setting it very high means you might have to wait ages for the export. The right number just depends on model complexity and size as well as your target. I picked a bit over a million to get a very high quality result. Once exported, I like to check the results quickly with Microsoft Windows 3D Viewer, as it's the fastest way to judge a mesh output. Looks good in our case. We'll move to Stager. We won't dive into Stager basics for this video. It's recommended you watch our Getting Started series first if you're unfamiliar with it. When you bring an export from Modeler in, the scale might not be correct. The object transform properties show you real life dimensions in centimeters. In our case, the toaster shows up as nearly two meters, so I scale it down to a more sensible 40 centimeters. When our model is correctly placed and scaled, we can move on to materials. Our model comes with a few materials, but I know I want this device to be mostly different colors of plastic. So I'll start with making a baseline plastic material that I can then create variations of easily. For plastic, I like to start from the basic subsurface material. I keep the material shelf clean and delete unused materials now and then. Our subsurface doesn't look right by default, it needs some tweaking. So when using subsurface, the material's main color isn't driven by base color. You need to go down into the interior settings and change the scattering color parameter. I'll pick a nice ba baseline color and then move on to the scattering distance, another key parameter. This one determines how waxy and translucent the plastic looks. Usually you need to set it very low for these small plastic devices. I like to use 0.1 as a starting value. When the scattering looks right, I want to move on to roughness. We could just use a flat roughness value for a very new, clean looking device, but I want to show you a technique to add some interest. If you go into the images section of the assets panel, you can drag and drop one of the grunge maps into the roughness slot for material. That will look incorrect at first, as the values are all over the place. To fix this, click the image thumbnail and then the little pencil button to open up Photoshop and edit this instance of the texture. You can now use familiar Photoshop tools to adjust the range and values. I like to add adjustment layers, they're less destructive and easier to work with. With a levels adjustment layer, I can push the values around to make them less contrasted. Remember, black values are shiny, white values are dull. I want a baseline gray with some slightly brighter spots in it. Having two windows open, you should see updates in Stager as soon as you save the Photoshop document. We'll use this technique a few times later on. We have one last change to make. Our material is using the UVs generated by Modeler for now. Those were not ideal, so Stager has a trick to fix this. At the top, under projection, we can set the material to be triplanar projected. Local means it will scale to the object size. Global means you can use global scene sizes in centimeters to set the material scale. Our effect is subtle, so you might not see the results clearly, but just keep in mind, triplanar mode is an excellent way to apply materials to models exported from Modeler or anything else that doesn't have perfect UV unwrapping. So with my base plastic setup, I'll duplicate it a few times and adjust the color and name for each variation. I'm also changing the base color, but this is just to ensure that the thumbnail color is updated. It'd be hard to tell them apart otherwise. When my three main colors are done, I'll play with material assignment. I'm making heavy use of control or command click on model parts. This allows me to subselect a part of my toaster and assign a material to only that part. So for this reason, it's always a good idea to work with many layers or sub-objects in Modeler, as it makes material assignment much easier. With the main colors done, I'll create some more materials for the buttons. For the small buttons, I want something rubber looking. So I'll start from a rubber material from the assets panel that I then tweak a bit. Again, I'll set it to triplanar and adjust the scale to match my object. The glass part of the screen can use the glass preset from the assets panel. 
So I'll just drag and drop that on. I can improve this with another grunge map edited in Photoshop, but it looks fine without for now. To assign a material to the display behind the glass, I use control click to select the glass, then hide it. That lets me select the main screen and assign a flat grade base material to it. The screen needs some interesting graphics, so I'm using some of these graphics that we prepared before in Photoshop. A PNG file with transparency lets me keep a material in the background. So I'll simply drag it onto my selected object and it'll be placed as a graphic. The middle handle lets me move the graphic and holding shift and dragging one of the side handles lets me uniformly scale it. Once it looks good, I'll tweak the base color to be a bit more green and move to the emission section. I'll pick a slight green tint and increase the emission strength a bit. It gives my screen a slight backlight and this makes it more visible in the shadows and draw some attention to it. Let's move on to the game cartridges on top. I want to add a label to them and the label area was made as a separate object so I'll assign a new simple glossy black material to it. Then we can use another one of those game label PNG files that we made. Instead of dragging and dropping what you can also do is the material has an add graphic button that lets you choose a file on disk. It works the same as dragging and dropping. The label looks pretty blurry and low resolution once we've placed it and this could happen with any part. It depends on how the auto UVs in Modeler have turned out. We can solve this inside Stager, forcing it to be high resolution. If I select the object and then go to Object Generate UVs and wait a few seconds, you'll see it change and your decal graphic might shift into another position. Just move it back. But in my case, things look much better after this step. So we'll just repeat what we did before, add the graphic and so forth for the second game cartridge. And then after that, I'm just assigning some more materials all over the object. I'm using slightly transparent, slightly subsurface scattering and slightly emissive materials for the LEDs on the top. And then I'm assigning some more plastics on the back. And then I test out a few different metal materials on the hot pot area. And it turns out that brushed aluminium looks the best. So I'm gonna stick with, uh, with that one. So we've arrived at some of the most difficult materials. That's the broth liquid and the bits of food floating in it. Almost all of them will be transparent or have some form of scattering. So for the broth, I'm starting off with a translucent material. Um, you can start from glass. And I'll use the absorption color for the translucency to control the main color. The bits of food and the egg, they're based on the subsurface material with some tweaking of scattering distance and roughness values. So I'll pick brown for the food bits, white for the egg, and then just tweak it a bit. And so at this point, I'm starting to use the ray tracing mode a little bit as it gets very hard to judge translucent materials without it. Uh, Real-time rendering doesn't look correct. Things do get a bit slower as these can be heavy materials, but it's good to make use of that. And then the last fun material bit is the bottom of the hot pot. I want some orange glow coming from the bottom, like there are heating coils in there. When I hide the broth meshes, I can select the bottom parts. I'll start with the glow material preset even though that one glows uniformly and that would be a bit too much. So just like with those grunge maps, I can use a simple black and white map to change what's emissive and what's not. If I take a simple shape from the assets panel and drag it into the emissive slot and then change the tiling to repeat it more, I've got my base shape. But this texture is black and white and I want it to be colored, so orange. So I'll click on edit in Photoshop to open it in Photoshop, but I'll give you a small warning. If you want to colorize a grayscale map, Sometimes they come into Photoshop as grayscale images and you need to set the image mode to RGB color if you want to colorize them. So I'll just quickly colorize that to orange, save it, and it updates in Stager. And that looks pretty sweet. So that's it for our materials. It's time to add some nice lighting to this scene. First thing to do is add a camera to our scene to save our rendering angle. Most of our lighting will be set just right for this angle, so we need to define it early. I'm just going for a simple three quarters view here. Then I'll rotate our default light around with the shift plus right mouse button to see if it works well. At this point, I can try a few different lighting scenarios by dragging and dropping them into the scene. I want something fairly dark and studio-like as I'll be building mostly custom lighting. Studio 04 works for me and I set it to light the front face mostly and leaving the side dark. I want this environment just to be a soft filler, so I reduce the intensity a bit, making it quite dark and underlit. Then I'll click the plus in the environment lights tab and this adds an image light. Image lights are composited onto this 
virtual light environment. They don't exist in the scene. I'll be adding a few, but this first one, I want to light the front face very well and cause a nice reflection on that top part. And I find the best way to set this initial direction is to use the crosshair button. It's called aim light and you click on a surface with that activated and it will try to make the light point at that spot on your object. Once the main light is done and that looks good, I want another nice fat reflection on the side to sort of highlight that surface. So I'll add another light and aim it and then tweak it. And this one should be much bigger. So under shape, you can actually switch it to be square and change proportions. I made mine four to one proportions and lets me get reflections just right. And so at this point, this happens often. I, I realize the roughness for the pink part, it's just a bit too shiny. So I take another trip to Photoshop and adjust things and actually save it as a PSD so the adjustment layer is still there. Yeah, it turned out that it was easiest to add another brightness contrast adjustment layer on top and then switch it to legacy mode. Sometimes levels is just a bit too finicky. It gives me some nice control. And with a little bit of back and forth, I arrive on just the right roughness value for that highlight on the side of the toaster. And so here's another lighting trick I like to use. I have a big floating rectangular light above my object. I'm going to use a physical area light in this case, dragged in from the top of the lighting list. These are different in that they add an actual physical object to the scene. They cast much clearer light and shadows on the object and ground, and they have a really nice feel in the way the light decays, but they're a bit slower to work with. And the important thing is don't scale them with the scale tools, but use the object settings to change their size. I want this one to sort of hover over the entire toaster and sort of position it right. Now I'm jumping between my set camera view and the viewport working camera a lot, but in the end, all light needs to be tweaked looking through the final camera. Once it's positioned just right, I'll tweak the intensity of the light. Physical lights have exposure and intensity sliders. Exposure is a logarithmic scale, so every increase by one doubles the amount of light. It lets you make large adjustments really fast. Intensity is more subtle, it's like a linear dimmer control for tweaking the amount of light slightly. And another trick I do with physical lights, and I always use this with glass surfaces, is to try and make it very obvious that they're shiny glass. If glass reflects nothing, it can be hard to tell it's there. So I like to put a big rectangular reflection diagonally across my glass. We'll add another physical light and tweak it to be a long, thin bar. And then comes the tricky part. We want to move it so that it reflects perfectly across the glass from our camera angle. We need to move it far away enough so it doesn't light up our ground too much. And for that, it helps to go back to the viewport camera. And uh, last, I'm going to tweak the exposure because it's way too high. I want to turn it down so I don't blow out the reflections on the screen. Now, I, I also find the blue plastic around the screen is too shiny. It doesn't contrast enough with the glass. So I could tweak the grunge map in Photoshop again. But in this case, it's just easier to remove it and use a regular slider again. It's a bit faster. And uh, once I find the roughness value I'm aiming for, it blurs the right re light reflection enough so that my glass part stands out a bit more. And our light setup still isn't done. The front corner is too dark, so I need a subtle fill light to brighten it a bit. Tweak the rotation height so it doesn't reflect too much, and then tweak the intensity so it does a subtle fill. And then my fourth and final light is another image light. This time I want to do a little bit more rim lighting. So that's a trick where you get light coming from the back. It brings out all the edges and forms out a bit more. It's, it's a nice trick to make a render pop and look more crisp. Now I need to check back and forth how this looks with ray tracing. If I turn it on now, the lighting doesn't fully match. Things are much brighter. It's my mistake. I should have checked earlier, but it's pretty easy to remedy. I just toned down the lights one by one to get it to look right with ray tracing. And that's it for the lighting. I'll set up a default background color and we can move on to rendering and post-processing in the next video.